for influences and things work, basically combining uh, the way our brain influences uh, our behavior. They can miss our own by asking who, uh, who knows the origin of the name of Okay. Well, you know what? What? Uh, where did the pub come from? From a pub. Right. <laughs> exactly. The very first pub con was held in an English pub, and since then, <laughs> uh, every other pub con has had at least one pub event associated with it, and that's particularly fitting because pubs were our earliest social network. The taverns date back at least to Roman times. Uh, and people have been using them for social networking ever since. So it uh, really is come full circle now that pub isn't just social, but also heavily social conference. Uh, so, since we're on that theme, uh, I'd like each of you to imagine a beer glass in your head. And, and if you're trying to imagine it, hopefully that isn't a painful experience for anybody after last night. But is, uh, imagine what it would look like, the shape of the glass. Okay, how many people thought of a glass that looked like this with more or less curvy sides? Okay, that's a, how about a straight vertical glass? Okay, just, just a few. Very interesting. Uh, scientists who were doing beer research, kind of not a topic, but scientists go where they have to go and do what they have to do, uh, found that in a curvy glass, uh, the average time to consume a 12 ounce beer is seven minutes. In a straight sided glass, it took 12 minutes. That's 60% slower consumption uh, in the straight glass. Now, the, the scientists couldn't determine exactly why that was. They uh, did some additional work and uh, decided it was probably because people uh, could not judge accurately when the glass was half empty, or if you're an optimist, when the glass was half full. In the curvy side of glass, very easy to give straight vertical sides. Not so easy when you've got sort of a wide uh, top and narrow bottom. The, and which, is important. If you're having a beer with Matt Cutts, be sure to give him the curvy glass and keep it straight one for yourself. <laughs> um, but while we're on the subject of alcohol and pub con, you should be aware of all these people walking around the events with cameras because uh, there's something that scientists have turned, turned the imbibing idiot bias. Uh, and it's this uh, rather strange effect uh, that when people are shown a photo of a person with or without alcohol in their hand, like a glass of wine, for example, uh, it drops the perceived IQ of that individual, even when all the other supporting information about the text information about that individual is the same thing. And uh, there what scientists think is happening is a, uh, there's an association of alcohol with cognitive impairment. And even though the individual in the picture shows no visible signs of being impaired, uh, that association sticks. Uh, and as a result, uh, they're judged to be not quite as smart as when they're not uh, holding that glass of wine or glass of beer. So, if your social profile photo has a glass of wine or some other, some other form of alcohol in it, take it off. You might wonder what this has to do with web marketing, since this is really a, a web marketing conference. And the point is that all of our behavior is controlled by factors that we have no awareness of or control over. Nobody's making a conscious decision to drink that straight glass of beer more slowly. Uh, it's just the way we behave. And this, every presentation that involves neuromarketing uh, has an obligatory iceberg in it. Uh, uh, and the reason is an iceberg is such a great metaphor for the way our brain works. Uh, estimates vary, but uh, typically they coalesce around 95% uh, of our behavior being controlled by subconscious factors. That's a huge amount. When we think, don't think of ourselves as being very rational people who make wise decisions based on facts, uh, that isn't true. And there's a lot of literature out there to support that. Again, yeah, so sort of web conference, uh, just to set the stage, uh, the uh, amount of content uh, has just exploded with 500 million websites uh, out there now, it's, it's insane. Uh, Google has 50 billion pages in its, its index. That is a lot of competition uh, to deal with for anybody, for any site. And in particular, what you want, if somebody does stumble across your site by finding it in Google or clicking a Facebook link or perhaps uh, through some other means, uh, take a click. What you don't want is them hitting the back button. That's, that's the worst thing that happen because that person won't come back. So what we're going to cover here today are what I call neuro nudges. Uh, and as Bob Cialdini said the other day, 
with the uh, opening of the conference, human behavior is not absolute. You can't simply say, do this, and people will do that. But what we're going to talk about are things that you can do that can nudge people in the right direction and improve the probability, increase the probability, that they will do what you want them to do. So getting back to those 50 million pages, say you've got your site, you've got some really wonderful, amazingly well-written content out there, uh, and you can drive traffic to that either through uh, SEO or other search marketing techniques. You can do uh, social sharing, try and push it out through social media channels, and that has a beneficial effect on the SEO side too. But ultimately, what you need to do is have content that engages the brains of your visitor, because that's going to have uh, a significant effect. First of all, uh, people are going to stay on the page longer, uh, maybe view more pages, they're going to uh, interact with the site more. That's going to help your uh, SEO efforts, uh, and it's going to make it much more likely that the content will be shared socially. Uh, and ultimately, uh, that's going to increase the probability that the consumer will take the action that you want. That could be filling out any form for you, buying a product at the e-commerce site, or some other uh, activity, but uh, if you can keep their brain engaged, they won't hit that back button. And the focus uh, today, since we've got a relatively limited amount of time, uh, is going to be on content and copy. Today, content marketing is, is perhaps the, one of the biggest buzzwords uh, because uh, now more and more, that's what's driving traffic. It's uh, creating great content, having that shared, uh, and then you're getting that follow-on search traffic from all the other activity. And what you really want, of course, is not just copy, but you want engaging copy, copy that lights up the consumer's brain. And the very first kind of uh, content that uh, you can do that, everybody says, okay, well, stories sell. I've been hearing that uh, since my early days in advertising. But the point is uh, that it really does work. This ad is uh, one of the longest running ads in history. It ran for decades virtually unchanged. It's for mail order music lessons. So it was not a very exciting product. Uh, and uh, it's all a story about how uh, this uh, person uh, sat down at the piano at a party. His friends laughed at him because they knew he couldn't play. And then he began to uh, play very well. And of course, they were amazed. Simple made-up story, but it sold an amazing number of music lessons. Uh, and even in the Philadelphia, it, it's, it's a huge amount of text there that people had to wade through, but it worked. Uh, and the reason that stories work uh, is because our brains are wired to like stories, to listen to stories. That's something that separated early humans from uh, other creatures out there. Uh, they could uh, describe their experiences in, in comparably, comparably rich detail. They could talk about uh, where there were food sources. They could talk about where there was danger uh, and relate this. Now, they could even pass information from generation to generation, how to do things and so on. Uh, and so we are still operating with those caveman brains and, and they like stories. Quite a bit of proof of that. A one really fascinating study put subjects in an fMRI scanner. It's one of these uh, big tube machines that uh, can give uh, real-time images of, of what's going on in somebody's brain. And they were uh, read the passages from the novel, and what they found was, and it was in a very sort of action-oriented uh, uh, novel, what they found was that people's brains lit up just as if they were performing the actions that the characters were. So uh, even though the, they had to be totally motionless in this tube, they're secured in place, their brains were actually running and jumping and punching just like the characters in, in the novel were. That's, that's engaging the brain. Another really fascinating experiment had a dual fMRI setup where they put one subject in one machine and one in another machine and had the first one <coughs> tell a story to the second one. And amazingly, that storytelling process, uh, after a minute or so, caused the brains of the two people to sync up and they could actually see the brains going uh, on, uh, up and down or act, act being activated uh, it, simultaneously. So uh, again, uh, this is a proof of how stories really engage us. They, they enable us, they're being spoken, to synchronize our brains with the brain of the speaker. The quick takeaway is use a story. I mean, again, everybody knows that uh, you should use stories, but uh, look at your 
uh, content and see if it uh, is talking about features or benefits or things like that, or if it's telling a story. And how many people have testimonials uh, on their site from happy customers? Okay. Uh, lots of folks, very good. Yeah, let's talk about a uh, special kind of testimonial. And we heard from yesterday, uh, the other day from Childine that yeah, testimonials are a good social proof for increasing your credibility. But story testimonials can be even more powerful. This is a simple story uh, testimony from the diet site. It starts off uh, about this lady who was in a relationship and she was having self esteem problems because she was overweight. Uh, and then after going on this diet plan, she both lost a lot of weight but also improved her self esteem and presumably lived happily ever after. Uh, people like that kind of uh, information. And this is an extreme example of a story testimony, also from a diet site, a different one, where each individual person's story ran for screens and screens of text. I mean, how, how do you get consumers who visit your site to read that much text? Uh, and the answer is you put it in the form of a story. And this starts off with her uh, childhood experiences. So she, she begins as uh, a child who has some weight problems and, and works her way through her life. Uh, but people love that stuff. In fact, you probably can't uh, uh, quite see it, but the link right under the picture says, read more stories. So uh, you like this one, consume some more stories. And over, as people do that, uh, that's definitely going to give a lot more credibility to the message that goes with those stories. So quick takeaway, story testimonials uh, for maximum impact. And, and to really stick in your customers' minds. Next, I want to cover a few magic words. The most magic word of all time, at least as far as our brain's concerned, it, uh, is the word free. Uh, for some reason, it occupies uh, a sort of special place in our brains. And, uh, clearly, back in those uh, early caveman days, uh, there wasn't currency, but there must have been uh, something that has stuck with us because Free continues to work. I just saw a, uh, a survey uh, of the things that would increase the probability of buying uh, on a, a website. Both of the first two reasons were like 70%, 50%. I had the word free, and then those uh, free shipping and or free, uh, free additional product. And one of the more fascinating experiments uh, on the power of free was uh, conducted by uh, uh, Dan Ariely, where he offered students either a Hershey's Kiss, which is a relatively fast food little candy with maybe a few cents, uh, uh, or a penny, or a chocolate truffle, which is a very desirable kind of candy, uh, for 15 cents. So, uh, and those would typically cost a dollar or so at a store, maybe even more. When he did that, almost everybody picked the truffle. It was a better deal, even though it was 15 cents versus a penny, it was a more desirable offer. So they, they chose that. But then he did something you know, with uh, another group, and he dropped both products by one cent. So the truffle was 14 cents, and the kiss was free. And amazingly, when that happened, suddenly the majority of people chose the kiss, even though the price differential was exactly the same. So it, the free label made that relatively unappealing candy a lot more appealing. Uh, Amazon proved to point unwittingly with an experiment. Amazon does an amazing amount of testing, but uh, this was apparently an accident. Uh, they ran a free shipping offer some years ago. It was a global offer, and they found that it produced a good lift in sales everywhere except in France. Uh, when they started digging into it, they found that in France, the offer had been translated into not free, but one franc, which at the time was maybe 20, 25 cents. <laughs> not, not a big amount, particularly uh, in the context of placing an order for products that would no doubt cost many tens of dollars. You wouldn't really think that 20 cents would have any effect on consumers. In fact, uh, it did depress the response compared to all the other countries, and when they restored the uh, actual free uh, meaning to the French version, they caught up with the rest of the world. So, it's, uh, the, the big takeaway is uh, use free offers instead of very cheap ones. You've probably all seen those sales, buy one product, get another product uh, for a penny. Don't do that. Make the second product free. Don't try to get that penny out of it because even though the, a penny is an inconsequential <laughs> amount of money, uh, it still says cost to
to your customer. Trust is something that's really important, particularly on the web, because there's no face-to-face -face contact. Uh, and so we all want to build, uh, build trust. How many folks use uh, symbols of trust, like uh, uh, Leaf McAfee, Norton, uh, other things? Got a business bureau. OK, very, very common. Uh, another element of trust is showing who else uh, buys from How many people put uh, client lists or client logos on their site? OK, we've got, we got some of those. All good things, and uh, very, very good trust builders. But uh, I wanted to really show that adding a very small amount of text to an advertisement caused a significant increase in the credibility of the uh, company making the offer. Uh, and in fact, the quality and the competency uh, ratings went up by almost a third. And so what, what was this uh, simple little change? They added one line of text, you can trust us to do the job for you. Sounds very simple, seems unnecessary almost. Uh, if you're writing copy, I'm sure uh, the uh, designer who designed the ad said, well, they need that text, and people know they can trust us. Or rather tell them we ought to provide some other more concrete way of showing that they can trust us, like a big money back guarantee. But in fact, these, these words had a significant effect on how the advertiser was perceived. So, don't really hesitate to uh, tell your customers that they can trust you. It sounds uh, superfluous, but it isn't. Who has heard that adjectives are bad for sales and bad for ad copy? Okay, well, it's it's a common, pretty common wisdom uh, in copywriters. If you read the uh, uh, Wild Art Copy Blogger, for example, uh, uh, adjectives are viewed as being they slow down the reader. Uh, they get in the way of the action words, like nouns and verbs. Uh, and in fact, uh, Dan Zarella, uh, also at PubCon here, in some presentations, uh, he actually wrote a study that showed uh, that uh, content with more adjectives in it was shared less socially. So uh, that seems like scientific proof that adjectives are indeed evil. Uh, but in fact, they aren't always evil. Uh, one study done by Ryan Wansick looked at restaurant menus uh, and uh, found that uh, sales could be boosted uh, more than a quarter simply by adding some descriptive adjectives. Uh, and these are some of the words that he tested. Uh, simply putting tender in front of the grilled chicken or satin in front of the chocolate uh, produced this kind of sales lift. Uh, in general, one that he put all the different adjectives, test them into categories. I thought they should be vivid, they should be sensory in nature, uh, they should be emotional and nostalgic. Uh, that's a, they don't, you aren't going to incorporate all these into a single adjective, but these are the kinds of things that really trigger those, uh, those reactions. Uh, they can be specific. And finally, uh, branded. Uh, that's, it's very potent, right? used to eat at uh, TGI Fridays uh, fairly frequently because they had a convenient to where I lived. Uh, and they uh, prominently featured Jack Daniels barbecue sauce and a lot of their things. Uh, I'm sure that uh, they had to pay uh, Jack Daniels quite a bit of money for that. I'm sure that most consumers uh, could not really taste the difference between the Jack Daniels barbecue sauce or some other barbecue sauce that their chefs could have designed that would have tasted very similar. But in fact, that branding clearly uh, sells uh, ribs and other products for that. This is a special case of uh, adjectives. Having a bad day, that's, that's a pretty common statement. And I think we probably most, most of us would agree that having a rough day is uh, also a uh, very similar statement, uh, basically identical in meaning. In fact, though, our brains process the two words differently. The rough adjective, which has a sensory um, overtone to it, and it comes from a sensory word, actually lit up parts of the brain associated with touch, even when it was used in this context of having a rough day where there's, there's no touch involved, it's uh, simply a metaphor. So when you can use a sensory adjective, even in a non-sensory application like this, uh, that will cause higher level brain activity. And so some examples of uh, 
words that work. It could work both ways, sharp, bright, heavy, slimy, fuzzy, smooth. Um, all of these have both sensory meanings and metaphorical meanings. I'm sure you come up with many others, but uh, when you're picking adjectives, um, keep in mind the sensory nature of the set of sensory stuff does light up the brain. So vivid, sensory, and emotional are your key outputs. The, the one thing I would emphasize is that you can listen to my advice or a lot of other experts here, but you should always test because just because something worked well for on one website, it worked well in a lab somewhere, uh, it worked on even sometimes a very similar site to yours, uh, don't assume that it's going to work with your visitors in the exact same way. Test it. There's some really amazing testing tools out there. I know we've and some of the testing uh, sessions here. There's uh, inexpensive and easy ways to do A-B tests and other tests. Uh, don't take my word for it, uh, test it, but do try some of these ideas because they will work for you. Uh, here are just a few uh, free resources, and this will be a, uh, in the slide deck distribution. Uh, uh, my two blocks of neuromarketing, uh, brain marketing and forks. Inside Influence Report is Bob Cialdini's uh, blog, which is, uh, has some real good stuff. Uh, Dan Ariel, the author of Predictably Rational, uh, has uh, some really interesting behavioral stuff on his blog. Uh, Social Triggers, uh, Derek Halpern, uh, has uh, great stuff, and his is also very uh, web and uh, sales oriented, probably uh, at the more practical end of the spectrum than the uh, uh, Ariel or Cialdini blogs. So feel free to check those out. <coughs> and, we do have time for a few questions if uh, anybody wants to discuss something. Can you back uh, one slide? Sure. Yeah, this, uh, the slides will be distributed, and if uh, anybody wants to uh, email me, I can send you a copy of the deck, too. OK. Yes, sir. So aside from like AB testing, a lot of us don't have a budget to get into some neural testing. How would you recommend us finding information on this or doing that around? Okay, uh, the question is, uh, since uh, a lot of us uh, don't have big budgets where we can actually do uh, neural uh, testing <coughs> ourselves, uh, what should we do? And, and the answer is um, read uh, this kind of stuff because uh, really, uh, you're right. The big, what big consumer brands are doing, uh, they are using uh, EEG technology, uh, perhaps in some cases fMRI technology, biometrics, um, deep metaphor testing, all kinds of techniques uh, that are designed to get way beyond uh, what people would reveal in a survey or a focus group. Uh, and that's great, but uh, most of us don't have that kind of budget. So the best thing that you can do, I think, uh, is uh, well, not the for one, but uh, read, uh, read uh, these kinds of blogs, uh, look at what other people are doing, uh, and just try and translate uh, that experiment, experimental information or uh, case study information uh, onto your own site. I think that uh, uh, that's by far the most practical. And that was that was really the key motivation of my book. I started off writing about all the uh, fMRI and EEG stuff, and I felt that at least for my audience, which is uh, a lot of people like this, um, that wouldn't be all that interesting because they might find it interesting, but impractical to employ themselves. So I wanted to provide. Uh, a lot of uh, simple, easy to apply tips. Question? Oh, yes. Well, one question. I've sat in sessions here, and the one we had yesterday on, on uh, Facebook was words don't matter, just a picture do, and that's what it's a picture, it's a picture, it's a picture, it's a picture, it's so many clicks. When do words come in? I mean, is it just a picture gets them to your website? Uh, okay, the question uh, is how do pictures fit in with words and the, uh, in a Facebook presentation uh, the emphasis was on pictures. Yes, pictures have a big influence. Uh, this, I've been being talking about uh, today content and, and copy aspects, but uh, one of the more interesting studies uh, uh, that I, I've used in other presentations is uh, one of, uh, of putting a photo of a baby in the ad where the photo of the baby is uh, uh, gazing out at you. And that, if you check that out with eye tracking, 
Uh, that's a huge hot spot. In fact, the, the baby's face is like the by far blows out the rest of the ad in, in attention. But if instead of staring out of, out of the page, the baby faces the headline, that gaze transfers readers' attention to the headline. So that's a way of getting the initial attention with the photo, but then directing it at the content that you want people to read, whether it's your call to action button, uh, your headline, uh, or some product features. And there, there, there are a lot of things you can do with pictures, and, and indeed imagery is very important. Emotional advertising in general uh, is very powerful, and uh, pictures can be very strong conveyors of an emotional impression. So, you know, really cool. so <clears throat> I've heard that that same thing, that the pictures should get them to read the text, the headline should get them to, you know, that people kind of tend to, especially if it's a long sales page, they'll hit headline, 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 then they'll go back and read the text of the headline that kind of connected with them. So the head, uh, headlines. But I, I want to know if you agree or disagree with this. I know all through this people are saying, you know, make your pages really user friendly. But I've seen these sort of long form sales page letters. And the stuff I've, I've read, if you're selling just one specific product, not, I'm not talking about a catalog page, that if you can actually get them to invest more time, yes. to watch the video, that the more time they invest, they actually feel guilty or they feel like they're going to lose something by leaving and starting their research over. Right, well, in fact, and that uh, ties into what um, Bob Cialini uh, calls consistency, where uh, if you've spent uh, 20 minutes uh, uh, reading this long page and watching a video, uh, it would be sort of inconsistent behavior to uh, just bail out at that point. I'm sure people do, but uh, again, that's one of those nudges that goes in the right direction. But the trick is getting people to do that. I mean, a lot of people, if they see a long, uh, block of text just a moment to read it. But uh, definitely, if the more you can keep people uh, engaged uh, with your stuff, uh, that, will, uh, that will help you convert at the end of the day. And that's why you do see these super long squeeze pages. Um, they work. But that, again, that's something you, that you need to test because for some products, people may not need all that sales copy. They may need just a very simple call to action, and boom, they're done. Uh, uh, in a lead gen situation, that would be the case because they're not getting up that much. If you're selling them a uh, $500 uh, video series or something, uh, you may have to get uh, invest a lot more time to get them invest more time to get the conversion. So would you say then that this this uh, this kind of puts a little more thinking into giving away a free product because your real, your real purpose in giving away a free product or a free report or a free whatever is to get them to invest more time so they come back to you. It's not just to give it away in, in, in order to make you feel like a hero, it's, it's in order to get them to invest more time researching the view in your product. Right, and that, that's true. And um, one element, too, of giving stuff away, every, every Legion page I see is uh, give up your information, we'll give you this ebook, this uh, special report, or whatever. Uh, something that's worth testing is giving people the content first and then asking for the information. And, and at least one test that actually converted higher it was the principle of reciprocity. But we're giving you this thing this free item, and oh, and now would you mind giving us your name? That actually outperformed the traditional give up your info so we'll give you the stuff uh, because it invoked that principle of reciprocity. <laughs> yeah. I've uh, read before that uh, typically a picture facing out of the audience where the <laughs> eyes are visible will engage better than a picture where the eyes are not visible. So first question is, do you know of anything that supports that? And then part B to that would be that I've also read, so it's a good idea to put like your, your primary headline in line with the, with the eyes of the, the subject you're looking at. And then how does that balance with, with what you earlier said about a baby gazing at the headline? Right. Well, in, in that case, you can actually see the baby's eyes, but they were looking to the side. They weren't freakishly uh, pointed sideways, but uh, when you could see the face. And, and it, yes, we are programmed to respond to faces. Put a face in, in an ad. Uh, where you've got like a full facial view, uh, our brains will home in on that, and uh, that, I guarantee you, will be uh, a big hot spot in the eye tracking test. Um, the question is, how do you then transfer that attention? So putting the headline or call to action in close proximity to that is one way. The gaze effect might help a little bit. Having uh, the person, the model points, or perhaps the model is facing forward, but pointing at something, uh, that there, there are different techniques for transferring that attention. Any more questions? Over here. 
Okay. Have you or you know anybody that has done uh, studies with subliminal images in, uh, in a network uses subliminal imagery? In general, uh, the question is about subliminal, subliminal imagery. Uh, in general, that is not uh, done. However, it has been shown that our brains do process subliminal images. In other words, uh, images that are flashed so quickly that we don't consciously process them uh, can then produce a, a later brand preference or emotional impression. So, uh, it's a, advertisers don't do that because it would be uh, bad for them if they did. And uh, I think uh, at this point, let me do one other question. I have to uh, turn it over to Mike. Yes. Um, my question is on color. So I've read a lot of um, different uh, theories about color. So is there a certain, are there certain colors on the rainbow spectrum that the brain gravitates towards more or have a more friendlier feeling towards? You know, there are all kinds of charts that show which colors are uh, more restful and soothing and which, um, which ones uh, communicate strength or different emotions. I'm, I'm not sure if I buy all of that. I know that uh, probably the most potent color effects are color contrast. So that goes back, for instance, your call to action being a distinct color from the rest of the site, uh, or the rest of the page that's on the surrounding area. Uh, that's where you really see color effect. I wouldn't anticipate it, uh, uh, whether you've got a, um, uh, you know, a, a blue headline or a red headline. They, they do have some emotional overtones. Not all of the studies agree on what they mean, uh, but using color to contrast, to highlight elements of the page, and those, those are all important things. And, uh, with that, I will say thank you.